Welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show folks, this is Tony coming to you from New Zealand and I have on with me today for the first time in the UK, uh, Mark Sutherland. It's nice to be talking to you Mark. It's an absolute pleasure to talk to you Tony, uh, thousands of miles away and first of all I just want to say um, thank you for all you do sir because it is a fantastic show so thank you. Oh, thank you, I much appreciate that. And I've actually um, heard you with uh, Lynn Liars, and um, I, you know, I kind of found that was really interesting, the discussions that you've had with her. So it seems right to uh, have you here today. So, um, yeah. And we just pray that God will direct us uh, in what to cover. So maybe the, I guess the first thing to do, Mark, would be to tell people who you are and what you do. Thank you, Tony. Um, so I'm Mark Sutherland. I reside in uh, in the London area in the UK, and I um, I work in uh, the film and television industry at times. I've produced a lot of my own short films, co-produced a, a feature film, and um, I recently, well, 2015, I uploaded a short film I produced called Between Lambs and Lions, which depicted a time when the Constitution of America had been suspended and there was complete overreach by the executive branch. And that was my small contribution to help wake up um, the electorate in America to what was going on under the 44th president of the United States, being Barack Hussein Obama. And before that, I'd made a, I'd produced a short film about a nefarious robot and uh, I now have another short film that we have to get out there, which is about uh, communism. So they're fairly sort of end up being topical. But I do work in uh, film and television over here because I'm a carpenter by trade. So I use uh, I use those uh, skills as well. Um, so I just get up to all sorts of things and then have the privilege to be able to do things like this and uh, and broadcast recently I got back from America where I was talking um, and just to try and see what's going on in the world really um, I am nothing special just a very ordinary person um, and I'm regularly listening to your show other shows just trying to glean information but as I find myself uh, being in a situation where in this country say within say within London you know we we're trying to wake people up when people are so deaf uh, to the signs of the times and what's uh, and what's going on. Um, so, Tony, I suppose that's part of me. I also have a teaching background. I used to teach in uh, secondary schools, etc. So I've done a number of things in life. Sounds interesting. And uh, like me, I've done a few different things as well. Uh, now you're, you're in London and, of course, you've got the elections in a couple of days' time, that's um, you know pretty interesting. I, I don't, mm. I, I don't know how much faith I put in the genuineness of elections. To be honest, the, these days, because I suspect that there are hidden hands that that send the elections in the direction that they want eventually. But um, yeah, it's certainly interesting times. I think uh, I think what you said is a very fair point, and also from your point of view, being in New Zealand, wondering how you then got your prime minister when it didn't seem as though there was enough votes for her to actually then achieve that position. Absolutely, um, and I think you you are abs you are absolutely right. And if we focus on if we think about what's happening here, um, so as you are more than aware, you know, in June 2016, we had a uh, we had a referendum, sir. We had a referendum on leaving the EU. Now, I listened with great interest to James Musker's show that he did with you, Tony, um, that I found there were certain things there. I just went, oh, my goodness me, I hadn't realized that. And I thought I was fairly well educated. And I think we're finding out over here, like, they have in the states that the deep state is deeper than we would ever have imagined to be honest and i think that's a reference also to what you're saying about elections so if we focus on our election or if we just look at the referendum for argument's sake so 17 million 410,742 people with a majority of over a million voted out to leave the eu it was a referendum given by our then Prime Minister, David Cameron, um, who 
then with I think 584 MPs out of 630 in the House of Commons had actually mandated that the British people would vote, have a full vote in leaving the EU. Leave would mean leave. That was it. Not leaving with a deal or anything like that. So as a democracy, which is a, a graduation um, from our from the sort of feudal system, um, we now find ourselves as a as a democracy. So we're graduated from feudalism, aristocracy in that sense, to this democracy. Um, and we could go on to discuss where we're at in many ways in that. But our democracy is at stake because if we do not leave the EU, then our democracy is over. And I'm not saying that to be dramatic. I passionately believe that. Um, so a couple of days time, we have the election. And uh, we, we've seen the fact that three and a half years, the, the parliamentarians have obstigated on that in the fact that uh, there was an election in 2017, Tony, where all the parties except one, to be fair, which was the Liberal Democrats, which is rather ironic when they call themselves Liberal Democrats, when they don't even believe in putting forward the vote in regard to Brexit and for us to leave the EU. They don't believe in that. So I don't even know why they've got <laughs> Democrat in the, in their title, to be quite honest. Mm. It's an absolute, f absolute farce. And I found myself in, in a television studio a couple of weeks ago where they were doing um, one of the election shows for a TV channel, which was rather interesting to watch uh, that particular leader and listen to other people um, while you're in the room. And um, so in 2017, every single political party except Liberal promised to put forward the mandate and to honour that. And we've found that the Labour Party, Corbyn, you know, I want a second We'll have a second referendum. We'll have a people's vote. We'll undo all that, which is rather ironic because Corbyn, as we know, is a complete Marxist um, and uh, total Marxist. Has an interesting, some unfortunate links with Hezbollah, you know, Hamas and all this, and yeah, attending various didn't meetings. Didn't call them friends in two thousand and nine? Uh, <laughs> yep, well, very well said. Plus, there is this whole whole thing of anti-Semitism that hangs over over the Labour Party or around him. But they are Marxist, people like O'Donnell, etc. Um, they wouldn't admit that. They then have a group called Momentum that is Marxist that's completely taken over the Labour Party. So suddenly this man is leader. Um, I'm praying that he isn't going to win. And then we can discuss in regard to the deal in a minute that's being put forward. So... We're at a stage, we've been at a stage where we've been fighting 75% of our MPs who hadn't wanted us to leave the EU. And eventually, after Boris uh, proroguing Parliament, we had that Judge Hale turn and said, no, it was illegal to do that in the Supreme Court. And we then reached a, a, an awful precedent where we now find that actually our judiciary can then turn over the executive branch, can actually politically influence us too far and actually undermine the democratic mandate of, a, of the vote that the people undertook. So this is what's all going on. And under, and we have to go back to um, people like Tony Blair. And I was very much a, asleep in many ways then. Um, go back to Tony Blair and pushing through the Supreme Court and turning around and going, um, history, now we're going to say that history now starts, you know, um, is all fantastic and all this kind of thing. And there he is entering number 10 with some big parade and marching down, you know, walking down the street, shaking hands. It was all one big publicity stunt. Um, and now we look back and in, interesting, don't we, on on the Iraq war and, and a dossier to justify that. We've all had these dossiers like the Christopher Steele dossier. So we see all this hidden hand. Of, of wars and all the rest. I hear what you're saying, and I, I have to say to you that the deal that Boris Johnson is putting forward is, is a deal that is exactly like Mrs. May's, where basically you would leave, to me, my own understanding of this, that, that you virtually leave in name only. It's like a kind of treaty. And to make it clear, in 1973, when we joined the EU, we lost the sovereignty of our nation, no matter what Ted Heath said an absolute liar at that time, we 
we uh, lost our sovereignty. And of course, Ted Heath, Ted Heath's mont- um, um, uh, sort of um, guy that he really looked up to, his mentor, that's the word I was searching for, was um, was Jean Monnet, the, uh, one of the architects of the EU. And when I start to read around, as I have been doing uh, vehemently about this subject, we then discovered that he has some very, very nefarious links, etc. And that within the EU, we could uh, honestly argue that the EU is the fourth is the Fourth Reich, is the Fourth Reich, is the industrialization of Germany and power. And uh, when you start to look at it in that way, you begin to go, oh my goodness, you're abs- you know, that's, this is right, there's a conclusion. So the EU is a supranational government, 27 commissioners that are unelectable, and um, it is not democratic whatsoever, no matter what, how people um, put that over. So we lost the sovereignty of our nation in 1973. Ted Heath knew exactly what he was doing. You go back to 1955 and the Suez crisis and someone actually having uh, we didn't we uh, had a little fracas with the Americans and we didn't then tell the president that we were going in to uh, uh, free free the um, Suez Canal from the fact that NASA had actually uh, actually um, taken it over into public control. And we went in there to actually sort that situation out. We didn't tell the Americans. They got very annoyed and they asked us to leave. And we had a very ignominious retreat. And by going, we began to lose our nerve. So the then um, Ted Heath, as he was a younger man, with Harold Macmillan, began to make a decision about turning not to America. James Musker has said some very, very interesting things on that, but to turn to turn to Europe and to take us into Europe. And when we were taken in into Europe in 1973, it was part of the Conservative Manifesto where Ted Heath said, I'm now going to take you into the EU if I win win the election. And he won the election. We were taken in. We were not asked about whether we wanted to be taken in. And then two years later, there was a referendum on that and whether we should actually come out. But bringing it sort of up to date with the kind of goings on and, as you say, the deep state and programming and pushing a particular viewpoint, it's very, very interesting when you read books about the BBC, books called The Noble Liar, and it reminds us of a presenter called Jack D'Amanio. And Jack D'Amanio used to present a program on on the BBC called uh, the Today Program, which still runs today, excuse the pun, um, hence why it's called today. So that still runs. Now, Jack D'Amanio was a Eurosceptic. He was a Eurosceptic. He would be, you know, speaking out against it. And Ted Heath then makes a phone call to his friend who was running the BBC radio. And uh, radio then is not what it is now or television channels where we don't have all the multi-multi television channels. Maybe at that point, there was, of course, there was far more in the United States. But we didn't have the sort of daytime TV and all this kind of thing, the proliferate channels that we have. So he phoned up Mr. Travorn, I think it was, and just asked uh, Jack D'Amanio to be removed. And Jack D'Amanio was removed. Now, when people go on about the bias of our media, yes, it is bias in regard to that. We see that now. We've just had a um, a scandal, uh, we say yesterday at this point in the program, um, that showed that a, a young boy, I think in Huddersfield, there wasn't a bed for him um, on uh, for in this hospital, and he was on the floor. When it then transpires, it looks like the mother asked the son to lie on the floor, took the photograph, and then the, this went viral and saying, isn't this disgusting about Tory cuts and all this? There was a complete and utter setup. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I'm linking the two is in regard to we see the pro- – you alluded to that – we see the propaganda war and what's actually happening. And I'm I'm concerned as you are. I think it was Stalin said that it was the it was it's the person that actually counts the votes that actually has the power, and um, we are seeing all the outbreak of cultural Marxism. We are seeing, uh, as I've been listening to Matt that you had on recently, and then Bill Randall's, of course, and overseeing what's going on in our world, and our country's contribution to this is 
a potential undermining of democracy completely that it doesn't matter what people vote for we're we're going to still stay in we have these uh, professional politicians that just what that's all they've ever known they've never worked in the real world we now move to this sort of i think it's we could call it and i'm just uh, looking at this this sort of plutocracy situation where it's down to people the plutocrats the people that have the money and of course we know that with people like george soros and soros has interfered in our referendum by backing someone called gina miller who immediately and they deny all this who immediately um then push forward a court case to undermine the referendum result they then she then was you know, uh, pushing forward whether the whole thing of proroguing parliament. And what I mean by that is suspending parliament. That's what Boris did to shut down the amount of days that people could, uh, the MPs could actually debate issues because we'd actually had a parliament until it was dissolved for this election of 834 days where all it would discuss is not a lot, really. It wouldn't be discussing us getting out of the EU at all, it would be slowly discussing the fact that it was changing its mind. And when you quite rightly talk about in regard to votes, in regard to all the interference, we then have to come up today and then look at the present leader of the Liberal Party, Joe Swinson, and we then begin to question uh, her husband in regard to a company that he works at, which is something like transparency, looking at fraud in, fraud in a transparency way. And I'm just trying to think of the company. But when you go online, you then discover that there seems to be a link with open society and having funding from a George Soros organization. And unless you um, have eyes and ears for this, you're not going to you're not going to see it. But the other thing is, Tony, that and a wonderful guy called David Geresh from the UK column is the real, real expert on this. And I think, you know, I'm really up for this. It's really, really important that we we state our sources and really give thanks for what people are researching and what they're doing. It's really, really important. So David Geras raised the whole issue of of a company, of a group called Common Purpose, which runs neuro-linguistic programming courses, which basically is training people for a post-nation nation. And we then jump across to the idiot I call him called Trudeau, who's running Canada um, or ruining Canada, in my own personal opinion. <laughs> yeah. um, and we t jump over to him and we look at the fact, as a dear friend of mine, Carl Chigrib, raised, um, who's an expert on this, going to UN meetings and all the rest and goes to Burning Man and researches all this stuff. He talked about that in 1970, 1997, um, a uh, and guy uh, talking about you know green issues um climate change and all this in canada and i'm trying to think of the guy's name raised the issue and said we've got you know canada we're it's going to be a post nation nation that's how we have to view it and of course trudeau on speed has said that and he's pushing every single liberal progressive thing he can through but over here we have common purpose common purpose was started in 1989 by julia middleton and she got the idea from leadership programs in america which sounds very familiar like uh, and all this and all this kind of thing it was before things like the center of american progress i would have thought and move.org but left wing and then when I wake up, I woke up and began to look at various things later later down the line. You then realize that this woman under a Tony Blair government had a had an office inside the John Prescott's office, who was the, our deputy prime minister at that time. And these courses are to train people. They do a load of courses in the BBC, the NHS, etc. And they are to train people for a post nation nation. So it's this whole thing of how you're getting people to think. There's no critical thinking going on anymore. We have to get you to think so you are all part of the sheeple. You are all part of the crowd. And if you step out from that, then you are then you are wrong. And you, um, in your interview with Matt, 
raised a really, really good thing in regard to the whole um, um, uh, Falau, um, Israel Falau situation, mm -hmm. where he is quoting scripture, right? He's quoting scripture. Yeah. And we're, we're finding that over here. And I'll give you an, another example in a minute. So we are finding that over here. So it means that, you know, in this post-nation nation, in this, we are training people to live in a post-Judeo-Christian situation. And when we look at the European, and this is, you know, these are all my opinions, assessments, but if we look at the treaty, the Lisbon Treaty in 2009-10, which was voted down, I believe, by uh, France and Holland in uh, 2005, is actually was put forward as a treaty. In the end, it came back, but it's actually a constitution. And the constitution does not recognize the Judeo-Christian culture heritage of Europe at all. It doesn't recognize that. I suppose when you've got Juncker going around uh, two, three years ago, unveiling a statue of Karl Marx made uh, made in China, then uh, maybe I shouldn't be really surprised mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And then we look at we look at books, um, which I can't grab at the moment, which talk about the fact that bankers and this comes down to the plut plutocracy, people with money running that. We say that within the aristocracy, yes, they had money, but they also had um, a sense of responsibility and what they should do and how they should look after people. And we, you know, we can look back on the First World War and how that churned churned things all upside down in regard to aristocracy and all the rest. But we have we have reached this. We have reached this particular particular point. Um, so and I'm slightly. Slightly don't want to go off. But, well, uh, but let me just jump in for a minute. You've mentioned James Musker. I just want to yeah. actually read a little bit of his, from his book, The New World Religion and the Beliefs of the Elite, and this is in Chapter 5, which ties in with what you're just saying. Uh, mm -hmm. Chapter 5 is called Social Engineering of the Masses, Propaganda, Propaganda, and More Propaganda. And I'll just read a couple of little bits here. It says, the cryptocracy keep control by get, creating mythologies which they sell to the people. The TV you watch, the newspaper, and articles you read on the computer are all used as subtle infecting devices to administer the viruses or memes to affect your beliefs as a method of advanced mind control. The news on the TV is used as a vehicle of propaganda. The information you receive about the world, current affairs and politics is completely biased. If you don't believe this, I suggest you think about these questions. Why is it that all the news channels report exactly the same story in the same manner and even in the same order? And why is it that we're always the good guys? Have you ever noticed any elements of double speak? I'll cut, jump down a bit. He talks about how there's... Uh, yeah, only a couple of main companies that control the world uh, news, mm -hmm. and in the US, six companies with all the media coverage. Um, yep. And uh, a couple of pages over, he um, he says, in 1933, H.G. Wells wrote in his book, The Shape of Things to Come, and this is a quoting from it, when the existing governments and ruling theories of life, the decaying religions and the decaying political forms of today have sufficiently lost prestige through failure and catastrophe, then and then only will worldwide reconstruction be possible. In other words, it is the auto ab chao, which means order out of chaos, chaos. spoken of by the Freemasons, which of course... H.G. Wells was a member. So <laughs> I look at all this that's going on and, you know, and James is great. I've, you know, learned a lot from <laughs> him. But I look at all of this and think this is what I see happening all over the <laughs> globe as a, um, you know, we've got unrest and we've got division and we've got protests <laughs> all over the show. And the goal, I think, is to get rid of the current political systems of democracy and all of that and replace them with a system run by a small group of elites and the rest of us are subservient to that because the rest of us don't know how to do this. You see, we're not capable of it. That's why we need these few special elites to run the world. 
Well, that and that and isn't and isn't is rather concerning because we then get back to Hitler of burning books. We then get to let bump off all the intelligentsia of every single country we invade. Anyone that has an opinion, anyone that's reading, anyone that's thinking. I have a very. I'm not just saying it to show off. I have a very interesting library here. I get books. Don't get stuff on Kindle. Get books. Start reading. Start doing the research. You're absolutely right. And common purpose is one big push of this. And um, what grieves me, I mean, I was in a studio today, which I won't mention, but it and people are going about there, you know, we're getting ready to make a program. And there's, you know, all these young earnest people all running around and they're all in a bubble, et cetera, et cetera. And it grieves me. It grieves me, Tony, that people are not thinking, they're not seeing what's going on. But actually, Tony, I think the my bigger grief is is our fight is actually inside the church. Yeah. Our fight is inside the church. And and I, you know, might say this, and I'm not someone that attends a mainstream church, I have to say. Um, and, you know, it's like, how dare you, you sinner. You're not under anyone's authority. You're not doing this, not doing that. I'll get over it. Um, but the fact <laughs> the fact is is that um, the church has be, is, is, is be fallen into mass, mass, apostasy yeah. and is not discussing these issues and as james brought that up you are bringing it up bill randall's in, in your other program the other day many other you know john haller many other people are bringing this up we're trying to look at the signs of the times and the issue is this is that yes all of these things going on and that we'll have chaos and that then the man of perdition will come on the scene well a load of churches in this country and there are some, because one of them I'm thinking is led by a dear friend of mine. We're not we're not looking at these issues. We're not discussing biblical prophecy. I mean, if we go down another little rabbit warren, I mean, a couple of verses that really, really woke me up. And that was it. It was when I read Genesis 6 verses 1 to 8. And the fallen angels would come down to earth and have sex with human women. And I'd never read it before until 2000, until 2010. I'd never seen it. Or if I had, I might have dismissed that. Yeah. And then it just dropped like a stone. And I just went, oh, my goodness. And I started going down. I grabbed the Bible and started going down this rabbit warren. Um, and just thought, man, oh, man. And then my whole, my whole paradigm shifted and began to see through things in a very, very different way of why the flood happened. Um, you know, Jesus, when will we know the days of your return as in the days of Noah? Yeah. Uh, where are we now? And and all this kind of thing. And then suddenly, as you were discussing with Bill, and he quite rightly pointed it out, you know, God's time clock, God's timepiece is Israel. You cannot, no other country has had people banished from their land. And then they come back to the land in the way that, in the way that um, they have. And there is no doubt about it. If we then look to the Tower of Babel, Nimrod going, right, I'm going to attack, I'm going to attack God. And then God then, people start, you know, talking different languages and go off, create different nations. And then it's, you know, Jesus said, I will come back to judge the nations. You bless Israel, I will bless you. You curse Israel, I will curse you. And um, all these things, a load of this in regard to replacement theology, um, is uh, is uh, taught massively over here, and um, and I was you know with what Bill was saying quite rightly is saying you know Israel is not above criticism, right? And as he was pointing out, they're in un in unbelief. Now we we're not looking at that. If we then suddenly reached a point of time, whatever people think of uh, Donald Trump, Donald Trump. I believe is then being used in regard to biblical prophecy as well, where, you know, you move, you move the embassy to Jerusalem um, and all this kind of thing. And the fact that, as has been pointed out by a number of people, that one of the reasons why the, the elites, the globalists want to then get rid of Donald Trump to get rid of Bibi Netanyahu is so you can then have a two state solution and all this kind of thing, you've been pushing the whole uh, Palestinian agenda, etc. 
the fact that we as a nation have been judged because of the Balfour Agreement and we rescinded on that and we went back on that in regard to allowing the Jewish people to have so much land. We went back on that. And that's one of the reasons I believe that we lost our empire in 1948. So all of these things are linked. And what grieves me, Tony, over here, and maybe this is just a sort of my own view and a UK assessment, is when we find ourselves immersed in, you know, Jesus is a social justice warrior. It's all about love. And um, yes, it's about climate change and Greta Thunderbird, what a wonderful young lady she is and all this kind of thing. And when you then point out to people, well, there is another viewpoint on this. You are then seen as a complete and utter nutbag and a fruit bat and mad. Yeah, and people will not look. People people like look at look at you. Sorry, I'll just say this. And they will not, as Hosea four verse uh, as Hosea four, um, verse six, I think, says, you know, my people are destroyed through lack of knowledge. They will not go and do the not the research, Tony. Yeah. See, I, I, I go to another probably different level um not saying above, but a, just a different place with the whole thing than you do regarding Donald Trump in that mm. because I don't think that the the top elites do want to get rid of Donald Trump. I, I think they put him there and um, he's there for a reason and the reason is largely for this chaos because you need uh, the, the Segalian dialectic with the left against the right. You need extreme both ends so mm. they can get us towards the system that doesn't work. This is why they need to jump in. I actually think Donald Trump is... I, I mean, yeah, they may impeach him. I don't think... I don't think he'll leave power and um, until. Well, I think probably they want to show that nationalism doesn't work. So, um, in a sense, Trump's a puppet to uh, to to do that, and then the extreme liberal left doesn't work either. So they have to bring us into the system that they want, this controlled system, which I don't think will be either one quite or the other. It won't be communism. And it'll be, I don't think it matters whether you call it um, communism or fascism. It'll be mm. a socialist type government mm. with a cryptocracy at the top. Uh, but, mm. but I think there'll need to be an economic collapse. And I mm. suspect Donald Trump may get another term uh, to make sure that he's there when the crash happens, or well, I could be wrong. I mean, I well, we on this show we were saying a year out from the elections that Donald Trump was going to be the next president, almost a year mm. before, and I never had any doubt that Trump was the 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 one mm. that the elites had chosen. I didn't buy the Hillary Clinton stuff. It was like. And I even wrote something about it the day before the election. I was because I was ninety five percent sure Trump was going to be the president. So mm. yeah, I mean there are factions within the left. These complete nut job, you know, anti Christian um, Democrats that that hate Trump with a passion. Uh, but mm. I don't think they're the controlling people. I think there's those above them. They're just being used as well in this whole impeachment thing. Um, and so he. Trump will only be taken out of power if they're ready for him to be out. But I think he's, I think he's part of the plans. That's where I'm at with it. Mm. I, I just, I don't kind of get this. We're in a battle to keep Donald Trump and the conservatives in power because then it's the end of the road if we, if Donald Trump isn't the president anymore and we've got to get it. But that's a dominionist theology. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I <laughs> yeah. and I totally I totally respect I totally respect your opinion and what and uh, and what you uh, and what you are saying. I mean, I have to say I am glad that he is president of the United States. I might not fully agree with what you're saying on the one hand, yeah. but I see it. Yeah. I see it. And then on the other hand, I think, well, okay, what is going on? What is this? You know, we look at the deep state. We go back. We go back to the trilateral commission. We go back to the Council of Foreign Relations. So we go back to uh, Chatham House over here. We go back to, um, uh, you know, people, people, I'm just trying to, Dick Cheney, for argument's sake, saying, you know, when I was representing the people of Wisconsin, they didn't realize I was on the Council of Foreign Relations and all this kind of thing. These one world government bodies. 
um, which, of course, Hillary Rodham Clinton has been linked to. When yeah, we look the, at the problem he, is, sorry to interrupt, but no, but um, Donald Trump hosted Henry Kissinger in the White House as yep. well, pretty much yep. twice now. I mean, if there's one man that epitomizes globalism, I, and it's Henry Kissinger, and he called Donald Trump his dear friend. Um, and, or sorry, Donald Trump called Henry Kissinger his great friend on two occasions at least that I have recordings of. Mm. He also, mm. Henry Kissinger said that, you know, Donald Trump has the potential to go down as a very considerable president. And mm. he he spoke more glowingly about Donald Trump than he ever did about Obama. So you've got to ask yourself why, if Donald Mm. Trump is the anti-globalist, why is Henry Kissinger Mm. speaking of him in that Mm. sense? Also, who was it that went to China recently uh, to to discuss, in an unofficial role, the trade deal between the US and China? It was Henry Kissinger. No, I mean, none of this can be refuted. And that classic thing when he was asked on the, uh, you know, the Wall Street floor with uh, with Obama, you know, when he has a chance to create a new world order and all this kind of thing. And then we go back, as you know, you go back to Herbert Walker Bush, you know, in 1992, KO2 saying we have a chance to create a new world order. Sometimes it is unbelievably confusing. But if yeah. we go back, yeah. it is. It yeah. really is. Well, I think how- actually that there's probably factions within the elite, you know, that are not in agreement with each other. Like there's there's a power struggle to bring in the type of new world order that that they want, and they won't all be in unity as to exactly how they want it. That's what I think's going on no. to some no. degree, at least. Yeah, but it's a bit like when James threw out the fact that. Um, we might eventually leave the EU, but they want to join. They want the UK to align with America. Yeah, I mean that was like that was like what for me? I just went. Excuse me, I haven't seen that one. I haven't seen that one coming. What does this mean? What does this mean? Are we? If we then turn to scripture, are we the merchants of Tarshish and the lions thereof? Yeah, you know what? What is all this about? And that's why I say the deep state. And a dear, another dear friend of mine said this, the deep state is deeper than we would actually think. So for argument's sake, uh, Donald Trump's going, you know, the new uh, the new deal that he signed with uh, Mexico and Canada is actually. Some people would argue, like a friend of mine, uh, Alex Newman, who writes for The New American and uh, John Burt Society would argue that it's a worse deal than NAFTA and GAFTA and all that ever was. So what is all this then about? Yeah. Um, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's, Tony, honestly, there are those times it's extremely tough. But if we look back at Hillary Rodham Clinton emails, if we look back of, you know, going into Libya, we came, he saw, he died, ha, 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 and yeah. all this kind of thing. And then maybe, you know, maybe she, uh, by not being in there, we haven't been firing uh, missiles at Russia so much. And then suddenly, to be fair to the Donald, he would like to actually get on with Russia and be able to have good relationships with Putin, to be fair, yeah. unless I'm wrong and I take that on face value. So, and I think I think it's wonderful at times to, it's good to have these discussions and really try and say, well, yeah, I can agree with you, but not sure, but agree yeah. to disagree in a brilliant yeah. way instead of, as we know, yep. Yep. online and with certain Christians, they're all killing each other. Oh, is it? Post trip, pan trip, whatever. Do you know what I, I mean? I tell you what, there's so much of that, and I'm seeing so much of that even on division about between Israel, like what the show I did with Bill Randalls. I mean, some of the yeah, comments yeah. I've deleted uh, from people are just mm. um, that really they just hate anything to do with Israel and, and the Jews. And then you've mm. got some on the other hand that are so pro, it's not funny. Mm. There's nobody seems to have a balance or look at it from scripture, a balanced scriptural perspective. Uh, they either take a section out here and ignore one there or whatever. And, and so, you know, I just find that uh, it can be frustrating. But in the end, I think, well, I can't debate absolutely everybody about absolutely everything no. or I'd have no, no. day, you know, no. Uh, no left. <laughs> and as far as I don't believe Hillary was ever meant to be the president. And it was real interesting in another interview I saw that you sent me that you'd done recently, you made a comment about how the leftists don't have any real policy. 
and yeah. um, and I yeah. thought, well, that actually, that's uh, that is perhaps a telling thing in itself. Are they actually setting them up for um, for failure deliberately because they don't have anything really? Uh, mm. In the end, um, to me, it's like, why would they put some people into power for the next round that don't have any policy? It's like they're just it's a shambles. It's almost better to have them in opposition destroying everything that one side is doing um, rather than having them there to make a complete mess with no policy. So uh, it's this whole division, divide and conquer thing that's going mm. on. And, I mean, I, I, I agree. I, you know, I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump, but I definitely feel happier to have him in there than I would uh, mm. a lot of those leftist politicians. Mm. I, mm. I have to say, I mm. don't dislike Donald Trump. I think what mm. I probably dislike more than Donald Trump is just the pedestal that many Christians have put Donald Trump on, which I don't think is scriptural. And um, and, and so you're I, right, and you're right. You're absolutely right, because we're not supposed to put anyone on. We're, up, we're asked to pray for our leaders, yeah. but not put anyone on a pedestal. No one is actually perfect and all the rest. I suppose the only thing I would say is that one of the reasons why your head does turn and people go, yes, but he got $5 million by his dad, but he has not come from a political background. He's done some, of course, he's a businessman yeah. done, and busted, made money. Then he had 14, 14 seasons of The Apprentice, Apprentice and all the rest. And I suppose some people really thought that the person going into the White House in typical sort of American fashion was a TV star. Uh, yes, that's one of the things he does, but yeah. actually is far deeper than yeah. that. And actually, that's, I think, growing into the role. And I, I understand totally and utterly what you are saying. And then we look at Hillary Rodham Clinton, who should be in Gitmo, yeah. wearing an orange jumpsuit for all the disgusting crimes that she's done yeah. and that are continuing and the ramifications for that. Yeah, but what did and, Trump uh, say after the election, after saying lock her up? It's like, oh, I don't want to hurt the Clintons. They're good people. Mm. Uh, well, I, I, I agree. And I've heard that. And then I've had friends of mine protesting outside uh, outside our house uh, in Upper State, New York and all the rest and other people. And they have. I, I agree with you. I totally and utterly agree with you. I'm as frustrated. But I'll tell you what, the, you know, the other thing is what is on my heart is coming back to the church, coming back to the church in this country. Sorry, maybe just before, and, and, before, sorry. before I lose my train of thought, and we will go there in a sec, but mm. I also just wanted to say um, that Donald Trump was bailed out of bankruptcy um, with the help of George Soros money in the past, and also he has a Rothschild representative that, you know, that basically they got him out of the trouble, which was Wilbur Ross. And he was working for the Rothschilds Bank, and he's now in Trump's administration. So I look at it and, and see that there are um, these people's fingers in in the pie. I just don't think that it's as clear cut as we're sort of shown. But anyway, yeah, we better I, talk about I, the church. <laughs> but, but but before you go on to that, I mean, I agree. I agree with you, and it's a bit like common purpose over here. Common purpose is the left wing equivalent of the Masons. Right to me mm. as a secret society, and you're absolutely right. And then you go into America and what's happened, and all the Illuminists and all the rest. And you're right. And and then of course the reason why they don't, you know, they want to get rid of America. They don't like the fact that these people can hold guns and it's life, yeah. love, and liberty and all this and all this kind of thing and what the Constitution stands for. And then we end up having a discussion about, well, a number of them were deists when they were writing it. Yes, of course. And few Christians, absolutely. And then we see the unfolding of that. And then, of course, the bringing about of the Federal Reserve and actually trying to undermine the Constitution of America. It's complex. It's complex. Yeah. And I think what you and I, what, I, what I'm saying, speak on me, is us being able to have this discussion really brilliantly, which we are, calmly yeah. and without going out and shooting people <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and going... You know, I don't want to. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Sometimes yeah. I'll do. I will do that with people when I just think you're not going and doing any research. You're not looking into this. Yeah. You're not looking into any of this. You shoot me down, but you're not going to go and read this book yeah. because it changes your paradigm and takes you away yeah. from just watching whatever television program. And that's how I feel about 
about the church because I just think we're not discussing meat. We, you and I both know, and Scripture says this, and I don't sit here as some theologian, but Scripture says, you know, judgment will start in the house of God. Mm. That is where judgment starts. And and I just, I yes, I tremble at that. But that is where it starts. And we have leaders, we have, you know, leaders of churches and all the rest. They have such a responsibility where I just think, so, you know, when someone's discussing the flood and and laughing over the fact that there's virtually a full size, uh, full size um, of the ark in Kentucky, I believe, and think, oh, maybe that's a waste of money to actually build that. Actually, what an amazing resource it is. And it's quite an amazing thing for outreach and and the gospel. That's the most important thing. And people are losing sight because we have this full frontal attack demonically because of climate change and all this yeah. kind of thing. And because of saying that our Jesus is a social justice warrior. And I, I know, and you know, I've had that as people say to me, well, OK, what about all the all the starving that's going on in Africa and various other countries, which, of course, is disgusting. Yeah. But if you then read, if you then read books the start and you go back in regard to the IMF and regard to monetary lending, you go back to 1975 and before that. But if you take that, if you then look at the amount of debt that we have then got African countries in, mm -hmm. if we then look at the fact that there might be 980, 48 billion pounds, dollars, whatever in offshore accounts that are linked to various, you know, various dictators or various leaders of African countries and stuff like this. And if you read books by Perkins, the economic hitman, and work out how the IMF, you know, the European Central Bank, any other central banks or whatever, have colluded, have created the the debt for these countries so that they are also being paid money all the time. And as, as well as, you know, you know, as well as I do, the whole fractional reserve lending system. But when we look at the fact that there's nothing there, it's all just paper and it's all relying on debt. So if people would look at these issues and what is actually going on and why you then want to replace uh, leaders like Gaddafi, for argument's sake, who's then, you know, one theory is he's going to start his own African country currency backed up by gold and yeah. all this kind of thing. And that would then undermine, of course, the other central bank uh, system, Bretton Woods and all this kind of thing. So if people, that's my deep, one of my pet peeves, frankly, is that people will not go and do the research yeah. and then they will criticize you and I. So, you know, we're going all over the houses, but I just want to say this. If I then said Alistair Campbell, who was um, uh, Tony Blair's press officer, basically, turned around and said, well, we're not going to discuss the German question. Well, if, you know, we can then go down, whether we have time, we may not have time, but we go down another massive sort of rabbit warren when we look at things like Operation Paperclip, uh, Nuremberg trials, science, Nazi scientists at the end of the war end up in America. Yeah. They end up in Russia. The fact that the, um, the Americans send up a V-2 rocket with a monkey in it. I did say a V-2 rocket. Where's the clue? V-2 rocket. V-2 rockets were fired at the UK from Germany. So how come that happened? Because under Operation Paperclip and brilliant books by Annie Jacobson and Nazi International by Joseph Farrell um, and, and stuff like this, when you go through this and you realize that at the Nuremberg trials, there were Nazis on trial. And then after that, you then had industrialists, care of IG Fairbairn, um, this uh, huge industrialist arch conglomerate cartel that... And then you look at books like Zeta Cohen, you know, the uh, Nazi history of Europe and uh, look at Hell's, uh, Hell's uh, Cartel, another brilliant book, talks about this and the fact that Nazis had a factory inside Auschwitz. You had all these slaves for these companies like Bayer, Boast, Host, etc. And that these industrialists then got behind Hitler because they thought this little shouty man with a moustache was going to take over the world. And that is their way of having cartels all over the world. And people are going, well, what has that got to do with it? And when you look at scripture, Genesis 6 verses 1 to 8, 
the fact that the watches came down to earth, had sex with human women, but they came down to earth and were passing information. And when you got the, you then see that Vernon von Braun, who was head of Hitler's rocketry, I'm not making any of this up. Yeah. Other people have done, you know, do this incredible research. I read it. And then Vernon von Braun goes to America and he's head of Hit, NASA. Of, uh, of NASA. <laughs> yeah first head of NASA. You can't make any of this up. But yeah. the key thing is this. They then allude to the fact that they get this technology from the other side, through the Thule Society. Yeah. Himmler had a library of occult books of 6,000 books in there. I'm not who, I'm not sure recently who talked about that. Um, but this is, this is out there as well. But none of these things are discussed. The occultic links of Europe, what the Nazis were doing, and the fact that they had a a uh, you know you've got the stealth bomber in America, and they actually built something that really looked like that years and years before. They would say that they got all their technology from the other side, yeah. from a cult. They would turn around and maybe and say you know from from the Watchers, fallen angels. Now, for us to even discuss this, and they're greater experts than me on this, like people like uh, Derek Gilbert and L.A. Marzulli and all the rest, they're greater experts on me on this. But these are things that are not discussed. These are not discussed within the church. They're seen as, as nutty. Oh, no. And the fact that we've reached a point now when we go, I quickly segue back into the whole EU thing because it is linked where people are going, no, we want to remain in the EU. We don't want to leave. Well, you don't understand the founding of it. And of course, as you rightly allude to, it is a leg of the one world government system. And Jean Monnet, the whole accusation of, be, of him being an OSS ag um, agent, the fact that um, of the Second World War, um, you, the the American generals at that time, I think Patton didn't was asked to denazify Germany, didn't really, and could see the cons the the concern of of communism coming right up, and to be able to stop that and actually to, to actually fight that. So a load of these industrialists that were on trial would then get a three, some of them very short sentences, and then would find themselves working back for certain companies again. And this is all documented as well. And that is uncomfortable, uncomfortable history that is overseen and is just ignored. So when Alistair Campbell talks about we can't mention the German question, I don't know if he, I doubt he's alluding to that. He's not clever enough. But it's the fact that you look at um, beginning just before the uh, turn of the 20th century, this whole thing of middle europe prussia all that rest all of that control and then you look at where germany is and the fact that um in 1944 you have a you have a meeting in the rouge hotel where nazis turn up knowing that they've they're losing the war and they have to they have a discussion that you know meant that they would have been shot by hitler if anyone found that out and then afterwards these industrialists are invited in of IG Fairbairn's bosses and all the rest, and to say, now you need to plan for the Fourth Reich, for the industrial Germany that's going to build after, and that will be ruling. And no one can dispute what has happened within Europe. And of course, that was paid by Americans. It was paid by the Marshall, the Marshall Plan, and uh, a fantastic book, Global Tyranny, Step by Step, The United Nations and the, and the Emerging New World Order. William uh, F. Jasper, I've had the privilege to broadcast with him. And William uh, wrote this book in 1992, where he, he says that the Marshall Plan was not General Marshall Plan. It was Jean Monnet's plan, one of the architects of the EU. Um, and what happened is that he then convinced a general to persuade the American people to pay for the rebuilding of Europe and said, well, if you don't, if we, we need to fight communism, that was the way that it was fed to Congress. And of course, then it's the industrial, the military industrial complex. And then Eisenhower warned about that before he stepped down in his famous speech. And then JFK was coming in and JFK then gave a very famous speech, as you know, I think 1962, warning about secret societies and all the rest. We're going all around the houses on one level. But my frustration, Tony, 
is my deep, 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 deep frustration is that the church here and maybe in, you know, certain aspects in your company, country and of course around the world and I know in the States as well, is not addressing some of these issues. And they think, well, what relevance is that? Well, if we do not learn from history, if we do not see what is actually going on in regard to how end time prophecy and end time events are lining up, then we are really, really going to get our butt kicked. And also, more importantly, is the emphasis of us, and I'm talking to myself, to get out there and preach the gospel and tell the good news of Jesus. And it's interesting because you raise the whole NAR thing. And quite rightly, where within that movement within the church, the seven mountains and turning around and going, right, well, we'll sort that out. We'll sort this out. We'll sort that out. And then we get on the God phone and then we phone up and we'll speak to God and say, look, when we're and I'm not being flippant or rude, but it's saying, well, when we've sorted this out, when we've sorted that out, then you can send back Jesus yeah. because then we've conquered. Yeah, that's pretty and much where, where it's at. We're, um, we're going to have to look to wrap up, too, because it's getting close up to an hour so not at all not at all so yeah so that is one of my major cons my major concern tony is my people are destroyed through lack of knowledge well the thing is i think one of my major concerns around that is that most people are not actually reading the bible for themselves and yeah. spending time daily in reading it and studying it and really mm. you're open to all forms of deception if you don't do that Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think what you've just said is brilliant. Absolutely right. And and that's the number one thing, isn't it, that Jesus warned, do not be deceived. Yeah, and there's so much deception and I only see it, it growing and I, you know, I see it in so many areas. Not that I have all the answers because we can all be deceived and that can include me. And so I'm always and, praying, and God, me. help me and not, me. not yeah. to be deceived, mm. you know, mm. and to keep things in the, the correct perspective. Because I notice there's so many people that are out of pers having things in the right perspective. They've only got a narrow view and they take one view and that's it. And they are mm. not veering from that, whatever the topic is. And I can think of a whole di lot of different ones. But, yeah, mm. it, this has been a really, really fascinating discussion. Um, and Thank you, John. Mark, we should look to try and do it again in the early in the new year, perhaps. I, w I would be uh, I would be honoured, sir, and I really, really appreciate the platform and the opportunity to do so. And may I just quickly say a plug: people, go and look up my little film between lambs and lions um, on YouTube. Have and, you uh, got a website or something that, where people can find you online? Um, yeah, they can find me online on www.creativehubproductionslimited.com. Um, but between lambs and lions, if you just uh, go into YouTube and uh, put that in you can then uh, find it yeah i've seen that and it, it, it is definitely worth watching so it's well put together very kind of you mm. very kind of you i've got to get the other one about communism uh, the iris echo out as soon as possible sounds good well thanks so much for being on the show mark and i to say this has been a fascinating discussion and the great thing is we can have slightly different opinions on things and it doesn't become <clears throat> at each other's throats <laughs> which no, is and so it's not, good and it's Absolutely, and it's not a salvation issue either. No, no, that's exactly <laughs> right. So, no, I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and yeah, we'll have to do it again soon. Thank you, Tony. It's been a privilege. Thank you very much indeed. Folks, visit a minute to midnight.com where we put all of our shows. You can find them on YouTube and on iTunes, and also on our website. Um, we keep all the archives of our shows on the website as well. The music in the shows I've written, played, and recorded. And also, if you want to help A Minute to Midnight through donating, that's the only way we keep this running. And it's really greatly appreciated when people do help us out. And you can donate at a minute to midnight.com. Thank you for listening, folks. God bless. And hopefully we will be back with another show in a few days' time.